know that it is time to get married to the world. They become one with the world. So when you go to Christian gathering from that day, you no longer see the difference between the church and immoral gathering, or between Christian dressing and halotry dressing, between Christian conduct and the conduct of the world. They became one and the same. The church festival and pagan festival, they become indoctrinated into the church. And this is the reason why this church is very important for our spiritual growth. Because we have to learn what the world becomes if we become the same with the world or we become joined with the world. The Bible warns us that we should not be equally yoked together with unbeliever. Because what concord has Belial with God? Or if that believeth, with him that believeth not. So this is the reason why the church should come out from among the world and should be separate. They should touch not the unclean thing. And God said he will receive them. He will be a father to them and they will be his children. But what happened when the church refused to listen to this advice? They rather choose to be one and the same person with the people of the world. And that is what happened in Pagamos. I will read Revelation chapter 2 from verse 12. He says to the angels or the messengers of the assembly of the church of Pagamos, write, This are the word of him who has and with the sharp to a sword. That is Christ, who has the two a sword, which symbolizes the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. He said, Right, I know your word, I know where you live, a place where Satan seat is enthroned, a place where Satan has his seat. A place where the worship of Satan was paramount. Yet, you have clinged and hold fast to my name. It didn't matter. You were in a place where Satan torments people day and night. You did not disobey me. You hold fast to my name. And you did not deny your faith. Even in the days, Antipas, my faithful weakness, was killed or martyrs in the midst of you. We are Satan boys. This place in Pagamon was a place inhabited by quality of evil. Satan has his seat and his base on it. And even to the extent a faithful witness of Christ was executed. But the church did not waver. The church hold fast to the name of Christ. Even though when they know they have just a little strength, but they hold fast to the name of Christ, to the doctrine of Christ. They never deny their faith at any point. Even when a faithful disciple was killed in the midst of the place where Satan had been saved. But this was a good thing. They could stand in the midst of persecution. The married church. There were Christians in the midst of the married church who hold on to the doctrine of Christ even at the expense of their life. But nevertheless, or but, I have a few things against you. You have some people who cling to the teaching of Balaam. That's always happened in the case when the church gets married to the world. Marriage does not only involve unity in the bonds of matrimony. Marriage also involves unity of religion, unity of culture, unity of belief. And that's why God warned Christians throughout history that they should not be equally yoked with unbeliever. That means they should not enter into a marriage festival with the people of the world. 
Not because God hated the world so much. No. So that he would not turn the Christians away from the God whom they believe. So that by getting married, you are expected to be one with your wife. That means she can persuade you, she can teach you her own way, her culture, her belief, and so on. It happened in the case of Solomon. Solomon was faithful to God all through his life. To the extent God sent and named him the demons because God loves him. And God, because of the love he had for Solomon, came to Solomon with an open check in the night and told Solomon, if you just say whatever you want, he will give it to Solomon. Solomon, in his kindness, asked for wisdom, not for wealth or power. But God said, because he asked for wisdom, he will grant him power, strength, wealth, that no man on earth will be as rich as Solomon, before and after. But with all these words under the hands of Solomon, his heart was lifted up. He began to fall in love with so many women, including strange women. And he fell in love with the daughter of Egypt, and even as far as the queen of Ethiopia. But something happened. In this bid for marriages, Solomon's heart was torn away from his God. And he fell and worshipped idol. He built temple for idol, and he himself worshipped the same idol, which was an abomination unto the Lord. This is the lesson we have to learn from the Pagamon. The Pagamon were Christians. They were not unbelievers. They were devoted believers. They followed God with all their heart. They stood trials and temptation. They were able to stand in the days of the martyrs of the saints, which few Christians today can stand. They were sound in doctrine. They were holy. They were chastened virgin up to Christ. They were waiting for the bridegroom to return for the marriage feast of the Lamb. But something happened. Because persecution was high, Antipas was killed, the church had melted. They went and joined themselves with the inhabitants of the earth. The church allowed unbelievers who became Christianized, Roman became Christianized, they abide politics into the church, the doctrine of kings into the church, and they forgot what God said to Lucifer in the book of Isaiah. Said thou Lucifer, prince of the morning, thou who said, I will ascend unto heaven, and I will build my throne above this above the assembly of the congregation. And I will be like the most high. And that particular doctrine was invited into the church. And it became the early doctrine of the church. The church began to adapt pagan system, political system of government, where we have king that's supreme. And instead of king in the church, the ministers now become the supreme, rather than become the servant that Christ said that if anyone will be the head among you, let him be the servant of all. But unfortunately, these leaders became the head of all, rather than being the servants that Christ teaches them to be. And as a result, marriage did not benefit them. The disadvantage of getting married to the world is you will learn the culture of the world. And the culture of the world is different from the culture of the Christians. The Christian culture is that he that must be the head among you, let him be the servant to all. But the culture of the world invites he that must be the head should be the richest or the biggest or the most powerful among you, while the rest of you will be the servant. And that is the doctrine of the world, and it is contrary to the doctrine of God. This was the reason why the church in Pagamos did not excel like the church of Smyrna. That's why they both faced persecution. Smyrna church faced persecution. They remained in their poverty, but in their poverty, Christ attests they were rich. 
But the Pagamas face persecution. In their persecution, they get married to the world. And because of the deed of the marriage, something came in. The doctrine of Bala. What was the doctrine of Bala? Teaching the children of Israel to commit fornication. To eat food, sacrifice to idol. As we can see in the book of Numbers chapter 25. Let us read. Numbers chapter 25 from verse. Numbers 25 verse 1 and 2. Numbers 25. Verse 1 and 2. I read. He said, Israel settled down and remained in Shechem. And the people began to play their harlots with the daughter of Moab, who invited the Israelites to sacrifice of their idol. And they ate and bowed down to Moab God. What this place did not tell you is that Balaam, when he discovered he could not curse the children of Israel, at the invitation of the people of Moab, he decided to teach them another way to overcome them in battle. He teach them to give them a full sacrifice for idol. While you may not find it in the Old Testament, you can find it in the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, chapter 2, from verse 12. Revelation, chapter 2, from verse 12. Revelation chapter 2 from verse 13. He said, The place where Satan is said true, yet you cling and hold fast to my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my weakness, my faithful one who was killed or martyrs in your midst, and where Satan dwelt. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You have some who clings to the teaching of Balaam. What was the teaching of Balaam? Who taught Bala to set a trap and a stumbling block before the sons of Israel to entice them to eat food that was sacrificed to idol and to practice lewdness, which is sexual immorality, and give themselves over to sexual to fornication or sexual immorality? This was the doctrine of the teaching of Bala. Bala was supposed to be a prophet of God. But because he loved the wages of unrighteousness, decided that, okay, I cannot curse these people because God has blessed them. Let me teach them another way. Let's teach them to go after sin and to eat in sacrifice for idols, to commit sexual immorality so that we can overcome them in battle. That was the teaching of Bala. So today, we still have Christians who, because they love the wages of unrighteousness, are ready to change the doctrine of Christ for a lie. And to compromise the spirit which they have received. To teach things that are contrary to the word of God. And the, Balaam, the doctrine of Balaam and the doctrine of Nicolaitis were similar. In the days of Balaam, they were idol to be worshipped. But in the days of Nicolaitis, the church has moved past idol. But there is another form of idolatry. Love the world. They teach Christians that gain is godliness. But the faith to understand that godliness with contentment is a great gain. And that is exactly the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans were doctrine of dominance. As Christians, you have to rule the world. And we fail to understand that Christ teaches the disciple that our kingdom is not of this world. That if our kingdom is of this world, his followers will have fought for the world. But because his kingdom is not from hence, Therefore, his followers do not fight. But the Nicolaitans teaches were contrary to that of Christ. And that's why Christ said, I did the adultery. And he said, But thou hold fast. What are the doctrine? What? Who were the Nicolaitans? And what was their doctrine and deed? But though, but this thou hast, thou hated the deed of the Nicolaitans. Which are also based in Revelation 2, verse 6. Have you ever wondered who are the Nicolaitans? We are mentioned in the book of Revelation, and who, however, they were, whoever they were, Jesus allotted their doctrine and hated their deity. 
Let's dive into the subject today to see if we can ascertain the identity of this group. What was their damnable doctrine? What did were they committing that elicit such a strong reaction from Christ? Let's begin in Revelation 2, verse 6, where Christ told the church of Ephesus, But this thou hast in your favor, that thou hatest the deed of the Nicolaitans. Hatest the deed of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Jesus was proud of the church of Ephesus for their hatred of the deed of the Nicolaitans. Which he also hated. The word hate is a strong word. Let's see exactly what it means. It comes from the Greek word misio, which means to hate or to abhor or to find utterly repulsive. It describes a person who has a deep seated animosity, who is antagonistic to something he finds to be completely objectionable. He is not very lotted and that objects or rejects it entirely. This is not just a case of dislike, it is a case of actual hatred. The thing Jesus hated about them was their deed. The word deed in Greek is anger, which means works. However, the word is also encompassing that is a picture of all deed and behavior of the Nicolaitans, including the Greek word Nicolaos, the compound word Nikos or Laos. The word Nikos is the Greek word that means to conquer or to subdue, to be in charge of. That's why today many of our churches take it out of their doctrine because it is not very palatable to them since they themselves are into the doctrine of the Nicolaitans to subdue or to conquer. The word Laos in Greek is another word for people. So the Nicolaus is means to conquer people or to subdue people under you or to rule over the church. The word mean people. It is also where we get the word Latin. When these two words are compared into one, they form the name Nicolas, which literally means one who conquer and subdue the people. It seems to suggest that the Nicolas were somehow conquering or subduing the people under their doctrine. That means taking leadership over God's house, where Christ is supposed to be the original head of the church. Now we have people who are servants of Christ taking leadership over the household of faith. Irenaeus and Hapotos, two leaders in the early church, who recorded many of the events of the events that occurred in the earliest record days of the church history, said the Nicolaitans were spiritual descendant of the Nicolaus of Antioch, who has been ordained as a deacon in Acts chapter 6, verse 5. Let's read Acts chapter 6, verse 5 and find out who these Nicolaus are. Acts chapter 6, verse 5. Acts 6, verse 5 says, And the suggestion pleased the whole assembly that they selected Stephen, a man full of faith, a strong and welcoming belief that Jesus is the Messiah and full of and controlled by the Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicol, and Timon, and Panemas, and Nicolaus, the apostolates, convert from Antioch. So we know something from here about the Nicolaus. The Nicolaus was a proselyte, a convert from Antioch, which was a convert from idolatry, who has been obeyed in deacon in Acts chapter 5, 6, verse 5. This verse says, 
that his saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, Philip, Pocarus, Nico, Timos, Penas, and Nicholas, the apostolate of Antioch, who we know quite a lot of information about some of these men that were chosen in the first vicar. Whereas little is known about other. For instance, we know that the chief criteria for their selection was that they were men of honest reports. That means the Nicolas are not unbelievers. They are Christians with honest reports in Christianity. They are full of the Holy Spirit. That means they receive the Holy Spirit as we also receive. They have wisdom, knowledge, just as everyone in the church has. They can do wonders in the knowledge of God. Once they have been chosen, they were presented to the people, to the apostles, who laid hand on them for signs and wonders, and installing and officially ordained them into the office of the deaconate. Nicol, the Nicanor, this unknown brother, was fond of good reports. He was filled with the Holy Spirit and with wisdom. Other than this, nothing is known of him. It is never mentioned again in the New Testament in Acts chapter 6. His name, Nico, means to conquer. That is the only thing we know about Nico. Nicholas, in Acts 6 verse 5, tells us that Nicholas was a postulate of Antioch. The fact that he was a postulate tells us that he was not born of Jews, but had converted from paganism to Judaism. And then he experienced a second conversion, this time turning from Judaism to Christianity. From this information, we know this fact about Nicholas of Antioch. He came from paganism and had deep pagan roots, very much unlike the other six deacon who came from pure Hebrew line. Nicholas' pagan background meant that he had previously been immersed in the activity of the occult. He was not afraid of taking an opposition, an opposing position, evident by his ability to change religion twice. Converting to paganism would have estranged him from his pagan family and friend. To convert to Judaism would have estranged him from his pagan family and friends. He would be to indicate that he was not impressed or concerned about the opinion of other people. He was a free thinker, like today. We have many Christians who claim they are free thinkers. He was a free thinker, a very open to embrace new ideas and concepts, irrespective of where he lives. Judaism was very different from the pagan and the occult world in which he had been raised. But for him to shift from paganism to Judaism revealed that he was very liberal in his thinking. For most pagans, we are offended by Judaism. We was obviously not afraid to entertain or embrace new ways of thinking. That is what Nicholas was. And when he converted to Christ, it was at least the second time he has converted from religion to another. We don't know if how many times he shifted from one form of pagan to another before he became a Jewish proselyte. He, his ability to easily change religions had implied that he was not afraid to switch direction or convert to any form of new idea that comes up in mystery or go totally different direction. According to the writing of the early church leaders, Nicholas thought doctrine of doctrine of compromise, implying that total separation between Christianity and the practice of occult paganism was not essential. From early church record, it seems apparent that this Nicholas of Antioch 
was so immense in occultism of Judaism, Judaism and Christian, that he had a stomach for all of it. He had no problem intermingling this belief system in various conscious and saw no reason why believers could not continue to fellowship with this, with those still immersed in the black magic of the Roman Empire and its countless mystery of the occult. The occultism was a major force that warred against the early church. In Ephesus, the primary pagan religions was the worship of Diana, the Artemis, and there were many other forms of idolatry in Ephesus. But this was the primary object of occult worship in that city. In the city of Pagabons, that numerous dark, sinister forms of occultic, occultism caused the Pagabons to be one of the most wicked cities in the history of the ancient world. And that's why Christ said, a place where Satan has his seat. In both of these cities, believers were lambasted and persecuted fiercely by adherents of pagan religion, forced to contend with paganism on a level far beyond all other cities. In, it was very hard for believers to live separately from all the activity of paganism. Because paganism and its religious were the center life of these cities. So, it now makes sense why the Church of Pagamos think the best way to escape persecution was to get married or get involved with the religions of the world. To teach that we can practice our religions while we do not disturb the religions or the doctrine of the earth. That means we can miss Christianity with frivolities of Christmas, idol worship, paganism, the goddess of fertility right of the springs, and so on. But this was contrary. That's why we can change the resurrection of Christ, which is the Passover to Easter. And we can change the birth of Christ to Christmas and so on. And this Doctrine it makes sense to many, and this was the doctrine of the Nicolaitans because it doesn't make sense for you to face persecution when you can easily escape persecution by allowing some little addition into the church. You can make the church today, Christian has made some of the church more attractive to Harold by allowing any dress code you choose, even you can wear pants to church. So by so doing, the world will feel comfortable inside your church. Instead of praying just hymns in the church, we can now put this Christian reggae, Christian blues, and salvation rock and roll in the church. And so the church becomes so liberal that sin and God can flourish in the same place. And this was the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And this made the church a compromised house. And Christ hates this doctrine because the doctrine of Christ was chastity, holiness. The reason why Christ warned us not to dress disorderly in the church is so that we would not compromise those who are weak in faith. But unfortunately, the Nicolaitans do not care about any other person other than themselves. They rather do all things to put other people under complete suggestion, take leadership over the household of God. And this was different from the doctrine Christ teaches the church. And remember what Christ said, every tree that my father has not planted shall be uprooted. And that's why the deed of the Nicolaitans have to be uprooted out. Because the church has become a compromised vineyard where sin reigns. And that is exactly what makes these Nicolaitans very interesting. They go far beyond the reach of Balaam. Balaam succeeded in luring the people to idolatry, and as a result, about 40,000 Israelites fought in the same day. What they could not achieve with salt, they achieved it by shifting the people towards idolatry and committing sexual immorality. Just as God warned us that we should not commit fornication, as some of them did 
and they fall in a single day, four and forty thousand. So we also should be careful not to love the world as some of them also love and they were destroyed by the destroyer. And this was exactly the doctrine the Nicolaitans introduced into the church, which is still paramount and prevailing in today congregational church. Most of these things did not go away when Pagamos church ended, but it transformed from Constantine till Augustine into modern theology, into the Roman Catholic Church, and through the Roman Catholic Church into the Pentecostal Church and the Anglicans and the Methodists and so on. All these doctrine did not stop in Pagamos. They were transferred from generation of churches to another. And slipping in at and out of paganism would have been very easy for a young and weak believer to do since most of their families and friends were still pagans. Because their family and friends are still pagans, so they have nothing to lose to sleep in and sleep out of paganism. They can easily identify each thing sacrificed to either and return to Christian the next day. So, and friends, we are still pagans. A converted Gentile would have found it very difficult to stay away from all pagan influence. It is significant that the deed and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans are only measured in connection with the church, with the churches in these two occultic paganic cities. Because these two churches were located in a place where Diana is worshipped. And it seems that a bad separation of the world in order to be a Christian, this in fact was the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And that's why Paul was writing unto the Ephesians and he made it clearer to them that they should love not the world and not the things that are in the world because this was the teaching of the Nicolaitans. That the world, that gain is godliness. You can have books, you can have everyone and have the world, which is not true. Because if any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him, according to First Peter. And this doctrine was contrary to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And the Nicolaitans teaches that you can have both. You can be friendly with the world and be friendly with God, which is contrary to the doctrine of Christ. And in this fact was the doctrine, the Nicolaitans that Jesus hated, it led to a weak version of Christianity that was without power, without conversion. The Christians who escape, Christians who were supposed to escape the corruption that was in the world through lust, but only to play back into the hands of the devil because they were afraid of persecution. A defeated worldly type of Christian who surrendered to idol and are afraid to take risks. This was the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitan deep roots in paganism may be produced in him as a tolerance to occultism and paganism. Growing up in a perverted spiritual environment may have caused him to view this belief system as not a damaging or dangerous one. <laughs> the rock possession would have resulted in a liberal viewpoint that encouraged people to stay connected with the world. Oh, God loves all men. God does not care about sinners. God loves you even if you are a sinner. You can be in the church and continue in your sin. Once saved, you are forever saved. These are all doctrines of the Nicolaitans. Christ hated and this is what numerous Bible scholars believe about the Nicolaitans. This kind of teaching would result in nothing but total defeat for its followers. When believers allow sin and compromise to be, their be in their lives, it drains away their power in the work of the cross and the power of the Spirit that is resident in a believer's life. This is the reason the name Nicholas is so vital to this discussion. The evil fruit of Nicholas 
doctrines to encourage the worldly pers participation in leading the people to indulge in sin and lower godly standards in a way it literally compromises the people. God wants to make sure we understand the doctrine in the Nicolaitan's thoughts. So Balaam against D. So Balaam action are given as an example of their doctrine and action. Because Balaam teaching of idolatry, because we have two forms of idolatry in the scripture. We have idolatry, which is having committing fornication with false God. Because the Lord says, Hear, O Israel, I the Lord your God am one. Thou shalt not have any other graven image before me. And that was the doctrine of Balaam. Balaam teaches the children of Israel to commit fornication. And they forgot what the Bible says. That every sin that a man commits is without the body. But if you commit fornication and adultery, you sin against your own body. And your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And God said, I will destroy. And that is exactly what Balaam teaches. He teaches the children to he teaches the Moabite to seduce the children of Israel to commit fornication and to eat things that were sacrificed to idols. As a result, to weaken their spiritual life and cause a total separation between the Christians and God people so that they can be slaughtered. Since God will not abandon Abraham because God said in one of his teachings, I have not found iniquity in Jacob. That I have given a command and I, have, I will bless. And I have blessed, I cannot revise it. And when Balaam saw that, he knew that God will never cause Israel. So the only way out is to lead these people to sin and to lewdness. So that when they compromise, they can be slaughtered. So today, what kind of doctrine do you hold in your church? Are you one of those that hold the doctrine of Balaam? Of falling in love with sexual immorality and perversion? And it is still sacrificed to idols, or who are holding on to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Also, commit sexual immorality with the world. Remember, the Bible says, Whoever joined his body with the body of a harlot became one with the harlot. So, if you also take the body of Christ and make it one with the world, you become one with the world. If your system of government in your church is the same with the system of government in the world, you become one with the world. If the politics in your church is not different from the politics in the street, you become one with the street. If your quest and lust for wealth in the church is not different from that of the world, you become one with the world. And remember, the Bible says, love not the world. Because any man that loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. This was the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Because if you get married to the world, the love of Christ can never be found in you. The Nicolaitans and the doctrine of Balaam, they are the same of opposite form. One is immorality, sexual immorality, physical in sexual immorality, with both women and eating things sacrificed to idols. But the other one is Sexual immorality in another format, not with women, but with the world. Loving materialism, lust of the flesh, pride of men, teaching that gain is godliness, taking dominion over the house of God. These are all love of the world. These are another coin of Satan. These were Satan's original sin. These are the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And the Nicolaitans as such were given an example. In Revelation 14 and 15, saying, But I have a few things against thee, a few things against thee, because thou hast them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. What are the doctrine of Balaam in today's churches? The doctrine of Balaam are people that teaches people to commit sexual immoralities and to eat in sacrifice to idol. Pastor can tell to his sister, Come to church, your dressing does not matter to God. It is only your heart. It is only your heart that matters. You can be a Christian even if you like. You, you do whatever you like. Just give your soul to God. That's not true. The Bible says clean the inside of the cup that the outside will be clean also. It didn't tell you to clean only the inside. The outside will not be clean. The outside inside must be clean. 
Because the cleanliness inside should reflect in the outside. Christianity is a doctrine of the heart, but it must reflect in your physical being. When people see you in the street, they should be able to identify the difference between a Christian and an unbeliever. Between a Christian sister and a harlot. Between a Christian brother and a thief. Differences must be clear. But if by the time you dress like a thief, you look like a thief, you must be a thief. If by the time you, you live in a home like a criminal, and you act like one, and you claim to be a Christian, you must be a criminal, not a Christian. Christ, there must be a separation between light and darkness. Darkness and light can never look the same. So Christianity must be separate from the world. Even when we must, with love and kindness, save people, we must not love their deeds. Their deeds and their stained garment of sin must be allotted by us as Christians. While we should focus on saving the lives, not their sin. Christian who focuses on sin will never be able to save their lives. Yes, charity is good, but charity is not godliness. Christians give charity in order to save the utmost charitable thing, the soul. But unbelievers give charity for praise and for faith. So Christians must understand the difference between darkness and light. Between Christianity and unbeliever, they should not be equally yoked with unbeliever. They should come out from the midst of ungodly nation and be separated from them. They should not teach the same doctrine. They should not apply the same rule because Christianity and ungodliness are not the same and they can never be the same. And we also understand that this Balaam talks to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. What was this temple block? To eating sacrifice to idols. To commit sexual immoralities. Because he know that God is a righteous God. And he says, I the Lord your God am holy. Because God is holy. Any unclean things. The Bible says he sold a sinner shall die. And Balaam understood all this. So he thought the only way to make Israel compromise is to cast a stumbling block in their front. To make God disregard his assembly. To make God turn away his face from the children of Israel. And so that the Moabite can defeat them in battle. So what did the Moabite genuine plan? Take the daughters of the world, the daughters of immorality and sin, and cast them into the camp of Israel in thousands, so that the children of Israel can compromise. They can commit sexual immoralities with them. They can take them to their idol services. And so that they can join themselves with battle. So, as a result, the children of Israel commit one term in the eyes of the Lord. And because they committed one term in the eyes of the Lord, and the Lord rejected the camp of Israel, they fell 440,000, and the prayer came upon Israel. What war could not achieve, immorality and sin did achieve it. So today, the same thing can happen in your church. Demon may not be able to fight you spiritually because he has no strength, but he can take some young Jezebel agent and cast them into your church. Dress prov sexual provocatively to seduce the pastor, to seduce your member, to commit sexual immorality. So as a result, the church of God will commit one term in the eyes of the Lord. The spirit of God will abandon the sanctuary of his strength. And because of that, the church will fall to Satan. This was the doctrine of Balaam. And this doctrine also abides the doctrine of the Nicolata, which is more dangerous because so many Christians see it as a righteous doctrine. Because this is not, not involve physical fornication or physical sexual immorality, but rather a form of spiritual fornication, of committing sexual immorality with the world, falling in love with the things of the world, the doctrine of the world, teaching that gain is godliness. Things that are contrary to Christ. And this is exactly what the church of today has found itself in. So, the doctrines of Bala, the doctrine of Bala, Bala could not succeed to cause the people of God. He used another method to destroy them. He seduced them to, to an obrido and sexual living. 
people that cannot stop sin, who eyes are full of sin, living and dangling the prostitute of Moab before the men of Israel. Noah chapter 25 from verse 1 to 3 tell us that Israel abode in Shechem, and the people began to commit horror with the daughters of Moab. And they and the daughters of Moab called the people and the men of Israel unto the sacrifice of their gods. And the men of Israel did eat and bowed down to their gods. And Israel joined himself with Baal. <laughs> that is, Israel married himself with Idol. Israel joined themselves with the world. These are people of God. People who God called the kingdom of priests. People that should be separated. A holy nation. A peculiar people who were chosen by God to offer spiritual sacrifice that was acceptable to God, which is their reasonable sense. But unfortunately, they joined themselves with battle. They became married to the world. Today, what is the state of your church? Has your church joined the world? Has your church married to the politics of today? Has your church joined the social and ideological warfare that is going on in the world? Has your church become a place where wokeness and human politics prevail? What has your church become? Just as the men of Israel compromised themselves in the world and forced religion. Now, you must understand another form of fornication is having carnal knowledge with a false god, which is false religion or false doctrine. Teaching a doctrine that was contrary to Christ is also another form of idolatry and fornication. And this is called spiritual fornication. And that is what the church today is involved in. And the Bible warned us that because of this doctrine of the Nicolaitans was encouraged to compromise. Compromise. God doesn't actually mean what he says. God is not God is not coming to destroy the earth. Oh, don't worry, the natural of the saint is not going to happen. There are so many doctrines that fit the doctrine of Nicolaitans. First doctrine. Doctrine of the Nicolaitans was encouraged to compromise. To make people take the easy way out. To make Christians feel it is more easier to get to heaven. Remember what Jesus says. For a rich man to enter into heaven, it shall be easier for a head of a camel to pass through the eyes of a middle. With the doctrine of Nicolaitans, so easier will it be even for you to enter heaven. Compromise in the world always results in weakness and powerless form of Christianity. This was the reason <coughs> Jesus hated the doctrine and the deed of the Nicolaitans. Because the deed of the Nicolaitans teaches you to compromise with the world. <coughs> Today, what kind of Christian are you? Are you the Christian who believes in compromise? And say, okay, I think the best thing for me to go is to compromise with the world. Compromise with the world will only lead to your downfall. It will lead to your spiritual defeat. Let's go back to the book of Revelation and read exactly what Revelation told us about the deed of the Nicolaitans. Revelation chapter 2 from verse 12. And he told us from verse 13 I read. He said, I know where you live is a place where Satan is in trouble. No wonder because these people dwell in a terrible place, compromise was needed to avert persecution, to run away from trial so that they will not be persecuted. Oh, if you just say your religions and the other one, they are the same. They are not going to kill you. So because you say that, you might be welcome. But also you are knowing that you are denying God. Oh, if I just welcome three politicians into the church, I will not need to contribute money among the missionaries so that we can build the mission house. We can just take some money from some few politicians and we forgot that whatever they give you is sacrifice to idol. And very soon they are going to ask you to become the launch point of their political campaign. And your church now become a political house, which is contrary to Christ, and you have not joined yourself with the world. A little living, living the whole world. There is a reason why the children of Israel forbid living among their bread. 
The reason why Levi was forbidden in Israel is so that because Levi is recognized as mist, which is a symbol of sin or false weight, something that rises out of ordinary circumstances. And that is exactly what the church will become if we lack the doctrine of Christ. That means we will rise for sin. And Christ hates living. That's why the Bible says, lifting living, living the whole Lord. Any small addition to your Christian faith or salvation can lead you totally to the opposite side. You become one of the Nicolaitans. That's why as a Christian, you should be steadfast, unmovable, always abiding in the work of the Lord because your labor in the Lord is not in vain. The Lord is a Christian never to compromise with the world. Love not the world because the Bible says if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So, our love should be focused on heaven. Our communication should be heaven. The Christ says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And every other thing will be added unto you. Today, are you seeking first the kingdom of God? Are you seeking first God's righteousness? Or do you want to follow the doctrine of the Nicolaitans? Or do you want to be like Lucifer, who said to himself, I will ascend to heaven, and I will sit upon the maximum of congregation, I will be like the most high. Do you want to be the, the, or the general prime minister who sits above all the congregation in your church? Or would you rather be like Christ, who, though he was a God, he taught it not robbed me to be equal with God. He made himself, he took upon himself the form of his servant, and he became obedient, even unto the point of death, even such a shameful death in the cross. When you look upon him, who has endured such contradiction for sin, will you be weary and faint? Remember, we were not called to a hope that perish. We are pilgrims. Pilgrim does not build permanent house. Few pilgrims does not um, gather up for themselves treasure on earth. Pilgrims dwell in boots. Pilgrims focus on their mission. When our pilgrimage is over, we will return home. That is where our house is. And as Christians living on earth, we are just pilgrims. Pilgrims take to the terms of pilgrims, not lightly, but seriously. You are the bride of the Lord. When your bridegroom, your husband, come, will he be happy to see the garment he gave you spotted with the world? Will he be happy to see all the addition and stain that were not meant for it being attached to it? Will he be happy with how much wealth you have gathered? Will he be happy how many political positions and permanent secretary you have embarked for yourself? Do you think Christ will be happy if he come today and meet you in this state? That is why you need to ask yourself one question. Are you really the bride of Christ? Or you have become the bride of the world? Are you the bride that Christ is expected to take in chastity, in holiness, uncompromised, unyielding bride? Now, have you become the bride of Satan and the world? We are stains and immoralities, and things sacrificed to adults allow, where sexual immorality is no longer in history, but it's something that you live by every day, are you seduced to adapt the doctrine of the world? Because you love the world, you want to be rich, you want to get favor in this world, have you forgotten what Christ said? What shall it profit a man if he shall gain this whole world and lose his souls in hell? Will your joy be complete if after you have become the president of the earth, you have become the owner of the multimillion church building, and at the end of the day you are cast into hell and into the utter darkness, where there shall be gnashing of teeth? Where there shall be gnashing of teeth? Is it what you want for yourself? The Bible says, I will tell you whom you fear. Fear not the one who can kill the flesh. And after that, there is nothing he can do. But I tell you who to fear. Fear the one after he has killed the body and the flesh. He is able to cast the soul into Guyana. You should fear him. Fear him. Fear God who after he has defeated your body and soul 
is able to cast the spirit away forever into other darkness where there will be crashing of teeth. The Nocalotans were just men. They wanted something, the good things of life. They wanted favor. They wanted blessing. But they thought there is an easy way out. Do you want to follow the easy way out? Do you want to be among those that will be rebuked by Christ on the last day that said, Christ look at them and said, Oh, they said, Lord, in your name we cast out devil. We heal the sea. We were filled with the Holy Spirit as the apostles were. We were full with work like other apostles were. We were rich in wisdom like your servant were. So Paul says the Lord, I know you not. You workers of iniquity. You workers of iniquity. Is that the doctrine you will be happy to abide by? Is that how you want your church to end? Workers of iniquity? Get away from me. But God says the Lord, he said he will separate the sheep from the goats. Will you be among the goats? Or do you want to be among the sheep? When the Lord, the master of the house come, do you want your house built upon the sand? Or do you want to build your house upon the rock? So that when the rain comes and the sun comes crashing in, nothing will happen to your house. The Bible says, woe is the man that built his house upon the sand. He said the storm came and the rain came and great was the fall of that house. Great will be your fault if you hold on to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. The Bible is saying the same to any man that have ear. It doesn't matter how many work you have. It doesn't matter how much you have resisted Satan. It doesn't matter how much you dwell in a place where Satan is. Do not hold on like this man at church. Hold on in your tribulation. Hang on. Christ did not put all that burden on you. Just hold on with your tribulation. Remain in it. Go through. Don't go over it. Don't try to find another way out. When there is time of trial, pass through trial. Pass through tribulation. The Bible says, as a good soldier of Christ, endure hardship. Endure hardship as a good soldier of Christ. Because the Bible says, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Do not take the easy way out. There is going to be a lot of hurting going on in this end time. But many Christians will be Something for the easy way out because iniquity shall abide. The love of many will wash cold. Will you allow your love to wash cold because iniquity has abide? Because Satan is taking dominance? Because the devil is not taking anyone lightly? But remember, we are in the end time, my brethren. Do not love the world, do not compromise your faith. Hold on to the end, and the Bible says you will receive the crown of life. Which the Lord shall give them that love is appearing. Are you ready to hold on? Or are you ready to compromise and eat the devil's good, which will only vanish after a little while? The blessing of the Lord, the Bible says, make a rich, and he add no sorrow to it. Are you ready to hold on until you endure to see him that is invisible? Are you going to wait like Job? You saw the suffering of Job, and you see the end of the Lord. How at the end he gave everything. That he lost. But are you ready to, like Job, hold on to the end? Or do you want to compromise? Or do you want to end up like Solomon, who, despite his wisdom and his glory, he lost it at the end of the day? And he become all like Samson, who, despite all his strength, a woman defeated him and his eyes were taken out. Is that how you want your Christianity to end? You want to end like Saul? Who, because of Jezebel, he compromised and he was slaughtered? Is this what you want for yourself? A Christian life, we have choices. God said, I said before you, life and death, cost and blessing. And he showed you Mount Eber and Mount Heaven as an example. And he told you, this is life and this is death. But choose life so that you and your family can live. So that you and your generation can live. Or do you want to choose death? Because if you choose death, you will die. God will not stop you from dying. But choose life so that you and your family can live. God bless you as you listen to this teaching. This is where we're going to end today's teaching. Brethren, before we pray, I want you to understand that we want you to follow up on this teaching every, every Sunday by 5 p.m. I, your host, is... Missionary Collins. This topic of today is known as Understanding Prophecy. 
And now, today we look at the church of Pagamos, the married church. What happened? Events that happened when the church get acquitted in the world. When they married to the people of the world. Instead of thinking about the things of heaven, they are not thinking about earthly things. They want to get earthly mansion. They want to get earthly church. They want to get earthly praise. They want to get earthly blessing rather than heavenly blessing. These are what happened. And you know how Pagamos ended up. How they end sharp rebuke from Christ. If you don't want to end that sharp rebuke, this is the time for you to return to the Lord. The Bible says you should return from where you fall. If you have ear, hear what the Spirit is saying to the church right now. And repent before God will come and remove your candlestick from his place. And remember what he said in verse 15. In verse 16. He said, repent then, as I will come quickly, I will fight against you with the word of God. With the sword of the spirit which is in my mouth. The Lord Jesus said, I said to repent, you will likewise perish. He will fight against you with the sword of the spirit. He who has ear, let him listen. And hear what the spirit is saying to the churches. And to him that overcome, I will give to eat of the hidden manna. The same manna that was hidden since the foundation of the earth, I will give you to eat. And I will give you a white stone with a new name engraved on the stone. And no one know or understand except the one that received it. So this is the blessing for the overcomer. Let us pray. Father Lord, we thank you. We we'll bless your name because of whom you are. We thank you for the blessing of the church that make it rich. We bless you because we know as many that will hearken unto this doctrine, they will be saved. Lord, help many to understand. Help many to talk, many to righteousness. Even at this end time, this we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Father Lord, as many that are sick, we pray for your healing. As many that are in bondage, we pray for their freedom. As many that are in captivity, we set them loose. Father, as many that the God of this world has blinded their heart that they cannot understand, we pray for your spirit of understanding. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God bless you. And we hope to see you next week Sunday in Jesus' name.